Hi everyone, this is GKCS. In this video, we'll talk about multiplication of two very large numbers. Specifically, we'll talk about three algorithms and the last one will be fast Fourier transform. Let me give you a warning. This video is not for everybody. If you are a person who's interested in algorithms in general or a student who's learning fast Fourier transform, then this video will be relevant. Firstly, let's say that you have two numbers and you have to find the result of these two numbers, okay, when you multiply them. The high school mathematics way of doing this is to note them down and then for each digit, multiply the other number by that digit. So 4 into 219 and 6 into 219 and because 6 is actually 60, so you multiply the result by 10. You take these two results and then you add them together, which is an order n operation and the result is 14,016. The time complexity of getting this result was order n square because for each digit, you had to do a multiplication with every other digit digit of the second number n into n that is n square and this is a rather slow algorithm because you can do this manually of course and it's very easy to understand but the problem here is if you have really large numbers which you want to multiply together in those cases the time complexity of this is going to be very large another thing that you might want to do is compose two functions so you have a function f of x and another g of x and there are many sound systems ai engines which need to compose two functions together in this case if you have n features or n points that you need to multiply then it's going to be an extremely long operation so here comes the saver karatsuba i thought it's a japanese guy but it turns out he's a russian he's no more but his algorithm stays with us when you have two very large numbers and you need to multiply them. You can actually do this recursively. So you take the original number of 219675 and break it into two parts. One is 219 and the other is 675. So 219 is multiplied by 1000 and then you have the remaining 675 added to it. And similarly, you have 64456 written as 64000 plus 456. So what's happened is you have taken some part of the number, the last three digits, and separated them from the rest of the number. Then what you do is perform standard school operations of a plus b into c plus d is equal to ac plus ad plus bc plus c. Remember that a here is just three digits long instead of six. And you know it's an n square operation, so instead of 36 operations, you're probably going to perform just nine operations for a ac or a ad or a bc or a pd. There is one problem though, as we'll see. You take these coefficients, use the standard formula, and so you have 219 into 64 with six zeros in it. You have 675 and 456 with no zeros in it appended. And finally, you have this middle term, which is 675 into 64 plus 219 into 456, which has three zeros in it. In total, you are doing four operations, four multiplication operations, as you can see the colored digits. And each operation is going to cost you n square by four. The reason for this is because you have half the number of digits. So when you square that, you get n square divided by two square, which is four. But you're doing four operations, so it's really not saving anything because 4 into n squared by 4 is n squared. So the order complexity is still the same. Karatsuba actually went back to this algorithm and at this point said, wait, I can optimize this further. You see the middle term, which has multiplication by 1000, that can be improved. You don't need to do two multiplications over there in that 1000 section. Instead, you can take the left and the right terms and subtract that from the sum of the numbers. You don't need to remember this. This is just me explaining it. So this is a single multiplication operation where you're taking the sum of the two numbers digits wherever you made the partition from there you take the sum and then you do one multiplication of these two sums but the major benefit is that instead of four multiplications you have now converted this to just three so you have now three n square by four for one split and this is a recursive al algorithm right because you can take the multiplication inside which is 219 plus 675 and 64 plus 456 whatever two results you get those two are also going to be multiplied and again you can apply the karatsuba algorithm over there in fact you can apply the karatsuba algorithm to every multiplication operation here so the benefit is recursive it's not just n square into 3 by 4 it's n raised to the power log 3 with the base 2 which roughly is n raised to the power 1.5 now this was further improved by tomb and cook and it's called tomb cook algorithm for that these guys actually took the karatsuba algorithm and made it a more generalized algorithm so instead of taking a number and breaking them into two pieces you can now break them into multiple pieces 219675 is broken into three pieces let's say 2, 1, 9, 6, and 7, 5, each one having their own exponent of 10. And again, 6, 4, 4, 5, 6 is broken into 6, 4, 4, and 5, 6. The benefit here is that if you break into smaller and smaller pieces, overall time complexity reduces. Having said that, there's a large constant factor here. So it's only done for very large numbers. If you use Java, it has something called big integer and big integer actually says I use Karatsuba initially for medium numbers and for large numbers it uses Toon Cook which has a time complexity of 1.464 approximately. This is not as important as you might think. The constant factor is really large here. 1.4 is where you're looking at. Now all of this is great. You can multiply numbers effectively this way but what about polynomial multiplication? What about a general equation like a of x and b of x? 
which have to be multiplied to get c of x we talked about certain use cases where you want to compose two functions so in this case you have stuff like this 2 into x raised to the power 5 plus x raised to the power 4 plus 9 into x raised to the power 3 and so on multiplied by 6 into x raised to the power 4 plus 4 into x raised to the power 3 and so on this is a hard operation because you're no longer looking at just one large multiplication you're actually looking at two functions being multiplied and therefore any point that is fed into this function has to give a resultant product answer so what can we do one thing we can do is start plotting points and basically what's happened now is you look at the first equation and the second equation and you think about them as graphs the first equation can have n number of points plotted for it the second equation can also have n number of points plotted for it and c of x then turns out to be every plotted point multiplied by the other plotted point a of x for one into b of x for one will give you c of x for one so if you feed in the values of x in a and b you will get the resultant values for c and why are we doing this because now you can get back that equation you can get c of x by using the points plotted over here it's standard stuff for a one degree equation you need two points for a two degree equation you need three points if you have three points on a plane then you can draw a second degree polynomial through it similarly cubic polynomials require four points to be plotted with that you can do this now what about a polynomial having n points and for us n is equal to 9 because the first polynomial is of degree 5 and the second polynomial is of degree 4 so we will need 10 points 5 plus 4 is 9 plus 1 because you need an additional point will give you 10 in general if you have two polynomials of nth degree then you're looking at 2n plus 1 points and so basically if you're looking at a 10 degree c of x then you're looking at 11 points of a of x 11 points of b of x leading to 11 points of c of x and with these points you can get back the equation of c of x you don't need any more points if you have lesser points you will overfit uh, or basically have a wrong equation but if you have more points then it doesn't harm you knowing this this is our algorithm or this is our strategy take a of x take b of x find 2n plus 1 points for each map these points onto a graph then take the multiplicand of these two that will give you 2n plus 1 points for c of x and then using those points using interpolation get the equation of c of x it's a rather simple idea instead of working with numerical values you are now trying to plot them onto a graph and then getting the graph points into an equation and because we need at least 2n plus 1 points and you know earlier our worst case time complexity was n square you know that we have to perform better than n square at least 2n plus 1 points have to be found so each operation in these 2n plus 1 have to be fast if you're taking order n operation time over here then it's useless because order n square was there also what's the point of doing it over here tom cook will be very disappointed with us so over here the amazing algorithms that we usually have where every point is optimized is not going to happen can't do better than this instead what you're looking at is amortization where the work you do for some points will end up doing half the work for other points so maybe you find the first three points and that does half the work you needed to do for the rest of the seven and in the rest of the seven when you found the first three amongst them the other three just became apparent this is called amortization where it's not that the work is distributed equally but some work results in the future work being taken care of great example for this is caching or dynamic programming where when you pull out a value it's pretty expensive but future values are fast to calculate because the initial values have already been calculated instead of looking at a of x and b of x which you can't really do much about you look at the first column which almost all of us miss out on right when you're doing a multiplication of two equations you're not going to think of hey what kind of points should i plot on the graph what should the values of x be should it be one two three four five okay it can be yeah it will work but you can come up with a more clever idea now you need 11 points and you need to choose these 11 points carefully okay so let's just note them down as w1 w2 w3 and so on okay these are substitute values these are not exactly one two three four five six what kind of numbers should we choose here should we choose prime numbers should we choose fractions the interesting thing that we said is we want to amortize our effort future numbers should depend on initial numbers and here one idea maybe fast exponentiation where x raised to the power 8 depends on x raised to the power 4 being done twice that's an interesting idea where does exponentiation really help you and the answer here is complex numbers in complex numbers let's take an example you have numbers defined as vectors on a 2d plane and it will become apparent why this is so cool because when you multiply two complex numbers what really happens is that the length of these two numbers are multiplied so if that's x and y then they become x into y but interestingly the angle is summed for every multiplication operation you have one addition of angles and you have a multiplication of the length of these two numbers 
Now we don't want to do multiplications. Those are expensive. So let's just make X and Y equal to one. That means that for every multiplication, all we are doing is we are adding angles. Why are we doing this again? Let's come back to the original point. We saw that choosing the points cleverly might help us reduce the amount of effort we need to put in. And so that's why we are going for complex numbers where every multiplication can be converted into an addition. And also these angles of complex numbers, what should we choose them as? Should we keep it at zero because zero plus zero is always going to be zero? That won't help much because you won't get any distinct values then. What we can do is say, okay, if two n plus one roots have to be found, let's take the nth roots. At this point, what's happened is you saw that multiplying two complex numbers leads to a rotation. And we are saying that we want to rotate 360 degrees at the end of finding two n plus one points. So that's what this will look like, two n plus one roots, where the first number makes an angle of 360 degrees divided by two n plus one. Second one is 2 into whatever that angle is, third one is 3 into whatever that angle is. And so at 2n plus 1, you have a 360 degree full circle. Okay, what's the benefit of this? Why did we choose these numbers? We know that the multiplication of these two numbers will always lead to a vector having unit length. And the second thing is it has some interesting properties. Because you're jumping by a particular factor of 360 degrees, right? If you jump once, you get angle theta, jump twice, get angle 2 theta, and you jump 2n plus 1 times, then you get an angle of 360. That means that if you have k jumps taken with this unit vector, so if you have taken let's say three jumps and you have another vector which is k plus n by 2. So if there are 10 jumps in total to complete 360 degrees, so every jump is basically 36 degrees. If you take three of them, 108 degrees and eight of them, which is 288 degrees, right? 108, 288 are diagonally opposite. They're off by 180 degrees. So theta and 180 plus theta. When you square these two numbers, what's happening here is that theta is being multiplied by another vector theta. So that is two theta because this is a complex number. So you just add the two numbers to theta. What happens to 180 plus theta? 180 plus theta is 180 plus theta into two, which is 360 plus two theta. 360, it takes a full rotation and then goes to theta. So effectively, these two numbers, which are totally opposite each other, when squared, give you the same number. That's one interesting property. This can help. And how does it help? Because when you have a point to plot, two into x raised to power five plus x raised to power four and so on, you can convert these exponents into something like this, where you have two into x raised to the power two plus three. So halfway is three, six being the degree of the polynomial. And now what that means is if these exponents start getting squared I'll have to perform lesser operations overall yeah that's the basic intuition the second thing is if you have a unit circle split into eight points and the current point that you're plotting is number two two into k divided by eight k here is 360 degrees so 2 into 360 degrees divided by 8. Instead of this, I can look at it as 2 into 360 degrees divided by 2 into 4. That gives me 360 degrees divided by 4. Okay, so if you split into 8 pieces and you're going at the speed of 2 versus you split into 4 pieces and go at the speed of 1, it's the same thing. Now, how does this help? Again, come back to the equation where you're plotting from point number 6. You have the equation on the right where the odd exponents have been put up and even exponents have been put down. Take x in common from all the odd exponents and effectively what's happened is you can substitute the value of x square by p okay why am i doing this why am i substituting the value of x square because now i need to go at only half the speed around the circle compared to previously okay remember that if you're going at x raised to power 8 then you need to take the circle and split it by eight pieces because that's the number of rotations you have to make to complete the circle if however you're going at x square speed then you're going at 2x the speed in terms of rotations and so p on will only have four pieces to the circle again the intuition here is that this property helps me reduce the number of computations i have to make overall combine these two properties help us perform the plotting of points on the graph efficiently so coming back to the original problem you have a of x and b of x and you want to plot 2n plus 1 points for each one you see what is the nearest power of 2 with 2x plus 1 so let's say in our case it was 10 i think so we are going to go for 16 and so now you have to plot 16 points on this graph to get back c of x remember that plotting more points is not a problem less points is problematic so 16 points when you need just 10 is fine and the first point will be like this 2 into w raised to power 5 plus w raised to power 4 plus 9 into w raised to power 3 remember that w is basically the nth root of unity shuffle the terms put all the odd exponents here and the even exponents here take one common value of w from the odd exponents make all the powers even and just put them one on top of another and now you can substitute the values of x square to p and this is a recursive thing because you can take values inside this equation and again shuffle the odd and even terms 
the value of p comes in common on the left hand side and all the exponents of p are again even that can be substituted again for q and so this keeps happening for the second point the third point the fourth point uh, the fifth point is interesting because it has w with the power of 20 remember we need only 16 points so at 20 you have taken a full circle so w is to the power 20 becomes 20 minus 16 which is 4 okay so the numbers get crunched down and so this technique is extremely efficient it actually came out long before the Karatsuba or the Tumkok algorithm came out 1805 it's by a very famous mathematician Goss uh, if you know about mathematical induction this is the person and the fast Fourier transform has incredible time complexity which is n log n into log log n log log n basically means you have a number of size 10 when you write down the size equal to 10 you need two digits to say 1 and 0 right the 10 that is log log of the number so it, it can be ignored it's a very small factor the fast Fourier transform is n log n uh, we are adding this additional complexity because we end up multiplying the numbers on the 2d plane and so those are the multiplication algorithms that you may know about I personally think it is interesting to know about these algorithms they help you appreciate some of the contributions that are out there and the second thing is i think it opens up your mind to new things having said that though this is definitely not an interview question or something that you want to ask on a test right it's something that maybe engineers would like to know about at a high level so thank you so much for watching this has been fun for me to understand i, I hope you understood if not if you have any doubts or suggestions you can let me know in the comments below i'll see you next time